Welcome back. In this video, I'm going to look at the third and final step of the top-down approach to investment called fundamental analysis. I'll start off by talking about fundamental analysis and what it is and why it's important in the broader field of security analysis. And then I'll review the ratios most commonly used in our ratio analysis. So what is fundamental analysis? Well, it's the study of the financial affairs of a business for the purpose of understanding the company that issues the common stock or other securities. So ultimately, when we talk about fundamental analysis, we typically say that we're looking at these economic fundamentals or the fundamentals of this firm because they're going to influence the value of the underlying stock. So we care about a huge number of factors here, say the competitive position of the company and its industry, the assets that are owned by the firm, the growth rate of the firm's sales or revenue, profit margins, liquidity, cap structure, all of these things are going to play into determining the value of the security that we're trying to analyze. Okay, so what do we need when we perform fundamental analysis? Well, on the firm financial side, we need a couple of the financial statements. We need the balance sheet, we need the income statement, and we'll sometimes need the statement of cash flows. So balance sheet, you know, we're just looking at the uh, position of a firm at a set point in time. Generally, we'll have multiple balance sheets that we're using. So going back in time or using a competitor's balance sheet as well for our analysis. We also want to have the income statement, which is just a summary of the performance of the firm over a quarter or a year. And then the statement of cash flows just tells us uh, the cash inflows and outflows of the firm. How much cash was spent, how much cash was received. Okay, so we take all of this data from these financial statements and some other sources, and we use them to perform ratio analysis, or looking at the relationships between different financial statement accounts through scaled values or ratios. So there's two ways that we typically do this. We can compare a company's ratios from one period to the next in what's typically called time trend analysis, it, or we could use our company's ratios and compare them to their direct competitors, so com companies in the same line of business. That second step, or that second part, that is peer group analysis. Okay, so what ratios do we typically talk about? Well, we'll say they break out into about six different areas, liquidity, efficiency or activity, leverage, profitability, valuation, and payout. So let's cover the most important ratios in each of these different areas. We'll start off with liquidity ratios. Higher is very often better with liquidity ratios, to a certain extent. Generally, these ratios, they tell us the firm's ability to meet its day-to-day -day expenses and satisfy its short-term obligations. So the higher these ratios, the more liquid the firm, the more able it is to meet its short-term obligations. The most basic one, the current ratio, current assets over current liabilities. This is just our, I mean, it's one of the most iconic most important liquidity metrics. Generally, we want this thing to be greater than one. If this is greater than one, it means the firm can pay off all its liabilities that are coming due in a year or less. We can also have the quick ratio. And the quick ratio is similar to the current ratio, but it drops off inventory. The reason that it does this is because for some firms, like, oh, car dealers or industrial equipment manufacturers, their inventory might not be that liquid, and so maybe it might be a couple of years before they actually sell it. So quite frankly, we, the reason we have the quick ratio, or sometimes it's called the acid test ratio, is because inventory is seen as less liquid, and we may not be able to sell it to cover our current liabilities. Okay, next we have activity ratios. And activity ratios, like I said, these are often called efficiency ratios. I, I tend to call them efficiency ratios myself. But generally, the higher the better here. High or increasing ratios generally indicate that a firm is either efficient or becoming more efficient. Uh, we have things like the accounts receivable turnover, so sales receivable or sales revenue divided by accounts receivable. So this will tell us how quickly a firm is turning over its accounts receivable. How quickly is it being paid in cash for sales that it's made? We also have inventory turnover, so sales over inventory. So how many times is the firm turning over its inventory every single year? So the higher the number, the better. 
probably the most important efficiency metric we have is total asset turnover, sales over total assets. So why is this so important? Well, it's because every firm can calculate this. Some firms, they might not have inventory. And so this inventory metric, probably not, not so useful to them. But services firms, firms that sell products, all of these firms are going to have a total asset turnover. So this is kind of like our, our best efficiency metric. It's the one that we always want to start with. All right, next, we have leverage ratios. And there's really about two main categories of these. Sometimes you'll see these things called solvency ratios. Uh, they just tell us how solvent the firm is. When I say solvency, basically, are they going to be uh, in business in the future? But you know, generally, these leverage ratios, they tell us how much debt relative to either total assets or total equity the firm has. So the most basic one, the debt to equity ratio, D to E. So generally, there's depending on how you ask people to calculate this, this is essentially just debt, either just long-term debt or short-term plus long-term debt divided by shareholders' equity. Uh, so typically, the higher this is, the more levered the firm is. We can also have the equity multiplier. And so this is just total assets divided by shareholders' equity. It says eh, more or less the same thing as the, uh, the debt-to-equity ratio. Uh, generally, the higher this is, the more levered the firm is. We can also have the times interest earned, or TIE ratio, for T-I-E. This one is what we sometimes call a coverage ratio. And we have a couple of different coverage ratio ratios out there, but this is probably the most famous one. This one tells us really just our EBIT over interest expense. It tells us how many times we would be able to pay off the interest on our bonds or other debt using just earnings before interest and taxes. Generally, if we see a higher number, that's always going to be better. So you like to see numbers 8, 9, 15, 30, something like that. That's going to be good. If we see something like 2 or 3 times earnings, a tie ratio of 2 or 1.5, big red flag. It means that firm is probably a little more uh, risky, so it's closer to bankruptcy. It's probably not able to meet its interest expense. That's not a good thing. Okay, next we have profitability ratios. And start with the most basic one, net profit margin, profit over sales. So uh, generally, obviously, all these are going to be in percentage terms. So the higher the profit margin, the better the, the firm, or you know, the better the, off the firm is. ROA, or return on assets, uh, my personal favorite. So just net profit after taxes, so your bottom line divided by total assets. Uh, this one it's, you know, it's another way to slice and dice the data. We just take total assets off the balance sheet, profit margin off the bottom of the income statement, and there we go. We can also have return on equity, or ROE. And so ROE is just your net profit divided by shares, uh, shareholders' equity. And it says the same thing. I mean, the higher numbers are better. Uh, generally, you know, we, we like to see high numbers here. Now, uh, one thing I should note about ROE is that it's got this really nice decomposition that, I mean, it's it's a bit archaic to show you this, but it is useful uh, to a lot of analysts. There's something out there called the DuPont equation. Uh, it's called that because it was developed by, I think, some researchers who were working for DuPont. Anyway, what this says is that ROE, so essentially net income divided by shareholders' equity, can be decomposed into three separate ratios. So here we have net income divided by sales, aka our profit margin. We have sales divided by total assets. This is our total asset turnover. And we have total assets divided by shareholders' equity, which is, you know, like I said, it's just another measure of leverage. So the more highly levered the firm is, uh, the, the higher this metric is. So why do we care about the DuPont equation? Well, it's because if we see that our firm's ROE is declining, we might ask the question, why is it declining? And this decomposition, this DuPont decomposition, allows us to determine exactly or get a better sense of why it is. Is it because our uh, profit margin is declining or because we're less efficient at turning assets into sales? Or is it because we're less highly levered than we used to be? So that's why we care about this. Okay. 
Next, we have valuation ratios. And these valuation ratios, generally, the higher the number, the more highly valued the firm. You know, some, some books out there will call these market ratios. I'll be blunt. I've not heard them called that in the real world. So generally, just call them valuation, valuation ratios. Uh, one of the most popular ones is the P.E. ratio, the price to earnings ratio. It's just price per share divided by earnings per share. Now, P.E. ratios, there's really two main types of these. We have the forward P.E. ratio and the trailing P.E. ratio. The forward P.E. ratio, notice what's here in the denominator. It's the expected earnings per share. The forward P.E. ratio, it's called forward because it's price divided by forward 12 months earnings per share. Just what do we expect the earnings per share to be 12 months from now or over the next 12 months? This is in contrast to the trailing P.E. ratio, which is price per share on the market divided by essentially just earnings per share over the past 12 months. Now, a couple things here. Generally, if we have negative earnings per share, we don't report that negative P.E. ratio. Notice if you know, we can't ever have a negative price here, so if our earnings per share are negative, that's going to make this P.E. ratio negative. We don't report a negative P.E. ratio. Rather, we very often just put in a dash or just write N.A. rather than you know, putting negative. Next, we have the PEG ratio. And Okay, some people like this ratio. I'm, I'm not that big of a fan. The price to earnings growth ratio. This tells us essentially uh, how valued, high, how highly valued the firm is. We take our P.E. ratio. Generally, this could be either forward or trailing P.E. ratio. And then we divide that by the last three to five years, either three years or five years growth rate in earnings. So if we have a very large number here, this P.E. ratio, which measures essentially just valuation of the firm. Uh, what this tells us is that the firm is likely to be more highly valued. It might even be overvalued. But if we have a, a low ratio, say less than one, what this says is that we've got rapid growth rate in earnings and the P.E. ratio is quite fairly low. So this might indicate undervaluation. All right, there are a bunch of other valuation ratios out there. So we have the market-to-book ratio, uh, just market price per share on, say, an exchange, divided by book price per share off the balance sheet. So we sometimes call this price-to-book. Most firms, really healthy firms, are generally going to have a price-to-book ratio of greater than 1. I think the average right now is probably like 1.6 or 2, uh, so Market price is twice the book price per share for the average firms. That's what that means. Uh, but you can find in some time periods and for some firms a, a market to book ratio in excess of like four or five. Uh, next, we have the price to cash flow. So just, uh, you know, there's a couple ways to calculate this. Market cap divided by operating cash flow or price per share divided by operating cash flow per share. Uh, generally, what this says is how much are investors willing to pay for every dollar of operating cash flow per share. Uh, if they're willing to pay a lot, that indicates they expect high growth opportunities for the firm, just like the rest of these valuation ratios. Uh, and then lastly, we have the price to sales ratio. So it could just, you know, I have the calculation here. It could just be market cap divided by total sales. Or if you want a per share metric, it could, could just be price per share divided by sales revenue per share. Uh, generally, just like the rest of these, what this really says is how much investors are willing to pay for a dollar of whatever is in the denominator. So a dollar of sales uh, is worth X amount to investors. So the higher this number is, the more highly investors value the growth prospects of the firm's sales. Okay, we also have some other metrics like enterprise value. An enterprise value is the market value of the total firm. If you've ever heard, oh, this company got acquired for $2 million, that price that's being paid to acquire that firm, that's the enterprise value. It represents the market value of all the sources of capital, all the equity, all the preferred stock, all the debt of the firm. So generally, we calculate the enterprise value as market cap. So this is our best proxy for market value of the equity, uh, plus the book value of liabilities, uh, the reason here is it, it's 
uh, maybe a little beyond the class, but basically there's not an active market for uh, a lot of bonds or a lot of liabilities. And so generally the best proxy we have for most firms is actually going to be the book value of liabilities. So that's why we use this. And then we subtract out the cash because the cash is just, you know, it's reported on the balance sheet and you're taking that, I mean, you're taking that into account here with these other two. So market cap, uh, market price times shares outstanding, book value of liabilities, that's just reported, and cash is just cash on the balance sheet. Okay, so why do we care about the enterprise value when we talk about valuation? Well, it's because, yes, it'll tell us the, the actual value of the overall firm, but we can also plug it into a couple of ratios, like the EBITDA ratio or the, uh, you know, the EBIT ratio is another one. But basically, the EBITDA ratio is another valuation metric. The higher the ratio, the more highly valued the firm is. And when I say EBITDA, this is just an acronym for earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Uh, so it's just before you take everything out. So we just take enterprise value divided by EBITDA, or you know, what we have here. So let's take a look at a quick example. Okay, so Ford's market price is $16 per share. The book value of equity is $6 per share. The firm had earnings of $7.1 billion in 2013, and it has $4 billion dollars 4 billion shares outstanding. Uh, let's calculate this stuff. EPS, PE ratio, and mark to book ratio. Okay, so here we go. We have necessary information to solve all these. We're just looking for these three components here. So our market price per share is $16. Our book price per share is six. So that's just total shareholders equity divided by shares outstanding. Net income is 7.1 billion, and we've got 4 billion shares outstanding. Okay, so our earnings per share is just going to be net income divided by shares outstanding. Trailing P-E ratio, now that we have our price per share and our earnings per share, is just 16 divided by the 1.775. And lastly, our market to book ratio is just our market price per share divided by book price per share. So here we go. Uh, yeah, so what can we do with this? Well, uh, with these two ratios, yes, they indicate some measure of valuation, but we'd want to see how that has changed through time or relative to, say, Ford's direct competitors like Tesla or GM. Okay, the next kind of ratios we have are payout ratios. And the payout ratios, these are just ratios indicating how much cash a stock has returned to shareholders. So we have our, our classic dividend payout ratio. That's just dividends per share in a given period divided by earnings per share. So if a firm pays dividends, generally you're looking at a dividend payout ratio of about 30 to 50%. Uh, although most firms do not pay dividends, and so their dividend payout ratios are obviously going to be zero. Uh, we can also have dividends per share, and dividends per share just tells us, okay, how much in the way of a dividend is being paid per share. Pretty straightforward. It's just total cash paid out in the form of a dividend divided by number of shares outstanding. Now, I realize I went over those ratios pretty quickly, uh, mostly because you know, you've seen these ratios in earlier classes, but I, did, I have put out a document, I just called it a summary of popular ratios on our Canvas page. So here's basically everything I had. These are just the most important ratios, the ones you should really have committed to memory, uh, certainly either now or in the next couple days. Uh, yeah, so I'll leave it at, at that. Okay, so let's recap. Fundamental analysis is the study of the operating and financial performance of a firm or its security or securities. Uh, we want to know essentially enough about the firm so that we can determine is this firm healthy or is it not. We use a lot of techniques, but ratio analysis is absolutely a critical component of fundamental analysis. So, you know, we look at efficiency ratios, liquidity ratios, profitability ratios, valuation ratios, payout ratios, you name it. And these are these are all things we should always look at if we're analyzing a particular company or securities issued by a particular company. So with that, I'm going to conclude, and if you have any questions, just reach out. Thank you.